So here with us is colleague and friend, Adam Alter, who is a professor of marketing at NYU Stern School of Business, who also has an appointment in the psychology department and the author of several uh, best-selling novels, uh, including uh, Irresistible, The Rise of Addictive Technology and Drunk Tank Pink, probably the worst title of any New York Times bestseller, and <laughs> also winner of best professor. Is that right? Something I have won. Let me think. One, two, three, four, zero times. I'm coming for your ass, Alter. Anyways, uh, we're glad you're here, Adam. Thanks for having me, Scott. And uh, let me just say, there's a thunderstorm outside uh, enjoying the the, uh, the interview. So if you hear anything loud, it's loud banging, that's what's going on. So Adam, we talk about the attention economy, but we've always been, or companies have always been motivated to figure out a way to get people to tune in, to watch All in the Family, to spend more time with the newspaper, uh, and then monetize that attention. Why is it different now? I think it's different for a number of reasons. One is there are more sophisticated minds working on this problem. The other half, though, is we have access to incredible data, rapid feedback, you know, billions of data points. And so you don't even need to be good at this anymore. As long as you have enough experimentation, A-B testing, pilot testing, you can work out how small tweaks in your in your program, your, your interface, whatever it is that you're doing, have either good effects or bad effects on how much attention you're capturing. And if you do that enough times, you can weaponize your product. The way I think about the morphing or where it's gone from benign or not good nor bad, but to something more malevolent is I think of my 10-year-old son. When he's watching TV, he's sitting on the couch. It's unproductive. It's, it's, it's lazy. But it doesn't seem harmful. And then I see the way he behaves around uh, this thing and the iPad and video games, and there's something, some drug gets in his brain. Is it the technology? Is it the dark psychology? When did, when did media go from something that, that was wasteful to something that was harmful? The single biggest change for me is, is just that the media follows us now. So if you ask American adults, and this applies largely to kids as well, uh, how much of the day on the average day do you spend where you can reach your phone without moving your feet? About 75% of the adult population can reach their phones 24 hours a day, which basically means that these devices, if you ask people, would you like to have a device implanted in your brain? They say, no, I'm a little squeamish about that. But we've allowed these companies over time to do that. So the minute we started carrying around a device that was a screen that was everywhere, everywhere with us, we, we came to expect that it would always be available. You know, no one, no one in the 80s and 90s got into an elevator and said, this is really painful. I wish I could play a video game right now. But that's exactly what we do now. And we've come to kind of learn, that's our new equilibrium, that every time you have more than, say, two and a half seconds of downtime, there is a device that will paper that over. It'll take whatever mild, mild vo version of boredom you're grappling with, and it'll paper it over and give you something to do. And it's, it's made us incredibly intolerant of downtime and periods where we can't access these devices because we've come to expect that they're always going to be there. So you've consulted to companies around this issue, both on how to be responsible, but also how to build in... Uh, addictive attributes. We have an online ad startup, Section 4. It's an app. We have the attention of 10 to 20,000 people at any given moment. Hardwire into, into this app for us the basic elements of turning an online ad offering into more than just an offering, but something that becomes an addictive substance. Some of them include things like making the experience social. So if you, if you allow people to take photos with their phone, they'll do that for about 10 minutes before they get bored. But if you then allow them to put those photos somewhere where other people will tell them what they think of the photos and therefore of themselves, that social feedback is incredibly addictive. So social is one thing. A second thing is goals. You set up a goal, even if it's totally artificial for someone, and then you push them to complete that goal, they will keep coming back for more until the goal has been fulfilled. So that's a big one as well. Um, a third one, I think, is probably the most insidious and dangerous, it's variable rewards. If you give people a certain reward, they get bored of it pretty fast. But if you make the reward unpredictable, you build in a little uncertainty in the way you do for say a lottery or for gambling, people and animals go crazy for that. But those three, the social goals and variable rewards and, and that, that broad class of behaviors or, or uh, you know features known as gamification, just turning into a game, a platform that wouldn't otherwise naturally be a game, is a, a big way to, to engage people to hook them if you do it right. So I immediately run all of this through the filter of Facebook and Twitter, and I see social, obviously. I see um, feedback in terms of uh, the number of likes, so affirmation, which is addictive. What are the random rewards that they have built into their business models? 
The random rewards are that you never know what you're going to get when you go onto the platform. It's also that you've posted something and you want to know what, how people are responding to it. So the social and the variable rewards go together there. This is where it starts to turn sinister in my mind, and that is, unfortunately, a key component of my addiction to Twitter, and I think I'm addicted to it, is I not only love the affirmation, the negative toxicity of it, and I'm embarrassed by this, is addictive for me. There's um, reward for people and um, currency in dunking on people at every opportunity. And when people dunk on me, it upsets me, but I find I get much more engaged in that stream. W what is it about us that's drawn to negative feedback? Does that just make the reward more random or is it something hardwired into us? Uh, the contrast is really important. If your baseline is has some negatives built into it, then the positives feel extra sweet. The other thing that's that's at play here, I think, is humans are very, very sensitive to negatives in general. Evolutionarily, it makes more sense to be sensitive to the bad stuff because you can live to fight another day if you if you can deal with the bad stuff. And so we find the bad stuff really engaging. And and you know, when Facebook did that test when they introduced all these emojis, they were curious about which of them would engage people. You know, maybe when people use the love icon, that's really engaging. Or maybe it's when they're sad. If you find something sad online, you're going to be engaged and you'll spend more time on the platform. That's not at all what they found. What they found was it's anger. It's the negativity. It's the high intensity negativity that comes from anger that galvanizes people. That's where you get these echo chambers. The algorithm is driven by this idea that anger will, will galvanize us and bring us to the platform and keep us there. Is there any evidence that when you're, uh, if, a, if a kid exhibits device addiction or spending too time, much time on video games or social media, that there's a link between that and substance abuse or eventual substance abuse? So the one silver lining from all of this is that it seems that most teens have a kind of a bucket to be filled with very engaging obsession-based activities. And if you fill that bucket with online experiences, there's not as much left over for things like smoking and drinking, which has been this interesting and I think to a lot of people very surprising trend. Um, I think there are plenty of negative psychological and mental consequences that come from spending hours and hours, like eight, six, eight, ten hours a day on a screen. But I think on balance for addiction, weirdly, by replacing substance addiction with behavioral addiction, I think it's it's probably been a good thing for the population on that front. That's interesting that it's actually been we have a certain amount of addiction or vices, and you're saying that this is, in fact, a zero-sum game, that it, it might be replacing other addictions. I, I hadn't heard that. Breakdown, a company that recently filed for its IPO, Robinhood. What are your thoughts around it hardwiring these kind of dark psychological mechanisms into the platform? I, I mean, I think if there's a villain in this space, it's got to be Robinhood. It's the most obvious villain because they're taking an activity that should be full of gravity. It's serious. It's important the way you use your money. You should be doing that in a way if you're investing where you understand what you're doing, what you're achieving. Turning that into a game where you're fooling people into engaging with a platform and, and throwing their money into assets they don't understand at all, to me, is it's kind of the worst of the worst. If Robinhood is the worst of the worst, how do we make it less worse? What happens is when an industry is young, people bristle at the idea that it should be regulated. This happens with every industry. It was true about oil and gas and resources, and now we regulate the hell out of those industries because we recognize that there are major negative externalities that come from them. Now, the world that we're in now, it's still a fairly young one, this tech world, and so we bristle at the idea that we're going to regulate that. But I think it's absolutely right for that kind of regulation. I, I also, I've never really bought this argument that it's about democratizing investment, because I think you can democratize investment without ensnaring people. So you wrote uh, the New York Times bestseller, Irresistible, The Rise of Addictive Technologies. You have kids. What is your approach? And you said something interesting to me. I was saying, do you just cut them off? And you said, no, you don't want to do that because then you risk them being ostracized. And I have noticed that my kids, when they're on these platforms, often socialize and there is some good from it. What is your approach uh, to parenting as it relates to these devices and these types of technologies? Well, my kids are small. I have a three-year-old and a five-year-old, so I'm, I'm a little bit behind on that. And a lot of the things that they, they might get up to when they're a little bit older I haven't really visited the household yet. So it's still, I think, a relatively easy time for me. One of the things I noticed, though, is I wrote this book right before having a kid. So my son was born right after I turned in the final draft of the manuscript. And when I was writing the book, I was really hardline about all of this. You know, I thought, you know, you just don't bring the screen into the home. Like, don't have the TV in a room where the kids are going to be. Don't have a phone anywhere near where the kids are. And as soon as I had kids, I realized that, that that's in practice incredibly difficult to do. And as you said, there is this flip side that if you are, if you're the parent who prohibits your kid from doing something that 99% of kids are doing, 
that's probably not the right move either because the whole reason for doing this is to make sure that they're socialized, that they have quality time with their friends, things like that. So I think as with most things, nuance is critical. So the, the best thing you can do as an adult is to understand what it is about the platform that matters to your kids. What is it that they get from it? And where is it costly? Where is it hurting them? Anyone who's a purist around screens doesn't have kids. So when you look at all of these organizations, if you were to say, all right, these folks are mindful. I think they're mindful of the addiction problem. And these folks are literally crack dealers uh, standing across from the, from the elementary school. I think um, the the social media companies are the crack dealers. I think, um, you know, the, the, the game they talked in the beginning was connection. And the very last thing you get is great, deep, important, nourishing connection from social media companies. What you get is addiction. You get hooked. And then what you see, I think the biggest litmus test for all of this is the, the gap between wanting and liking. So when we talk about addiction, addiction is basically in the beginning when you find a substance that you're addicted to, you want it and you like it. It feels amazing. So you really like that thing and you really want it. But what happens very quickly is you stop liking it. There's this gap where liking goes away. You start to hate the drug because it's ruining your life, but you really want it. The, the wanting doesn't go away. And that's the destructive side of, of these addictive processes. And when you talk to people about social media companies, they have this deep disliking for them, but they really want to be on the platform. That gap to me says something profound. It says that they're doing something that isn't working. They're making us hate them and yet we can't stop using them. And that to me is the big hallmark of the problem. But then there are a lot of companies, I think there are companies that we we really want to engage with, but that we love. We feel very positive about them. And they, they might be education companies if you're learning a new language. A lot of people have a really positive feeling about those companies. You find companies where wanting and liking go together as they should. And then you find companies where there's this disjunction between them and you know that that company has tapped into something to get you to keep coming back more and more, despite the fact that your liking has decayed to the point where you basically hate the organization. Adam Alter is a professor of marketing at NYU Stern School of Business with an appointment in the psychology department. He joins us from his office in New York City. Adam, thanks very much. Thanks, Scott.